Good evening, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, you are you have joined the uh, Indigenous Environmental Network free prior informed consent webinar. Uh, we're giving a few more minutes to just let other folks join, but you are in the right place. Hello, hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. You have joined the Indigenous Feminisms webinar with the Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, this webinar, it was going to be about free prior informed consent. Um, you are in the right place. We're just giving a few more minutes for others to join, but you are in the correct place. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Benishi Albert, and I am with the Indigenous Environmental Network. And you have joined us this evening or afternoon. Uh, you've joined us this evening for the Indigenous Feminisms webinar on free prior informed consent, uh, protection of land and body. So I thank you all for joining us and um, I'm going to pass on to our interpreter, interpretation team uh, to share a bit with us about how to make sure we are addressing language justice and making sure we can all understand each other. Thank you, gracias. Um, hi everyone, my name is Catalina and here with us also Colin and Silvia. We're going to be interpreting into Spanish and Portuguese. So we're going to give an announcement on those two languages and how to access interpretation. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Catalina y acá también está Colin y Silvia. Vamos a estar interpretando al español y al portugués. Entonces vamos a dar un anuncio rapidito para eh, informar cómo acceder a la interpretación. Hola y buenas noches y buenas tardes para todas y todos. Eh, mi nombre es Colin y yo voy a interpretar para portugués hoy en noche. Estoy aquí con Catalina y con Silvia. Y vamos a dar una, un rápido, rápido anuncio sobre cómo acceder el servicio de interpretación para el webinario de hoy noche. Bueno, entonces, eh, 
si están en una de las plataformas de Facebook o Twitter, pero quieren acceder a la interpretación, tienen que venir directamente al Zoom. Então, se você estiver acessando esse webinário através do Facebook ou outra plataforma de mídia social, você tem que vir diretamente para o Zoom para acessar o serviço de interpretação. Então, escrevam um mensagem no chat dessas plataformas para que eles deem o enlace direto ao Zoom. Então, por favor, escreva uma mensagem no chat dessas outras plataformas para poder receber o link do, do Zoom direto. E uma vez estén no Zoom, já está activada a interpretação, então você pode ir no globo que diz interpretação, fazer clique nesse globo e escolher seu canal de idioma. Então, uma vez que você estiver na plataforma Zoom, você pode, é, pode acessar o serviço de interpretação clicando no, no globinho que tem aí na tela, na parte inferior da tela, e uh, selecionando o seu idioma e clicar em finalizar. Um, so, we were just uh, telling folks to please write a message in the chat of the platforms that you're at if you would like to access interpretation into uh, Spanish or Portuguese to come directly to the Zoom. And then uh, the interpretation option is already activated. You'll click on the globe and select your language channel, whether it's English, Spanish or Portuguese. Muchas gracias um, por su compromiso a la justicia lingüística. Thank you so much for your commitment to language justice. And of course, we honor all of our languages that are present here. Eh, much much muchas gracias eh, por su compromiso a la justicia lingüística y honramos todos los idiomas que están presentes acá. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, muito obrigado pelo seu compromisso com a justiça linguística e honramos todas as idiomas que estão faladas aqui hoje à noite. Muito obrigado. We pass back to you, Benish. Thank you. Thank you very much to our interpretation team. Um, this is important because um, these these webinars have been reaching across um, the colonial borders that um, tend to try to divide us as indigenous peoples of this hemisphere. And so we are initially doing these in the languages um, other countries that are represented. So thank you very much to our team who, who do this with us every time. Thank you for your diligence. So this evening, um, so this evening we are here um, to talk about um, free prior informed consent and the protection of land and body. Um, this is a, a discussion that we felt was important for um, uh, for Indigenous women, and um, we're going to get into that in a bit. And um, I would like to make sure that we start out this discussion in, good, in a good way by opening up with a prayer. And I would like to invite my, um, my counterpart co-conspirator, Simone, also from IEN, to um, introduce herself and then open us with the prayer. Thank you, Benishi. Can everyone hear me? Our power went out, so I'm on my phone. Uh, standing up next to a window to get some light. So forgive the awkward angle. Um, so I'll just introduce myself in my language first and then I'll just offer us a little blessing to get us started. So buju chinoda nikwe and dijanikas, mikasi and duodame, miskwagami wisaga ikining and donchipa, and Niman Wayne Damjo Wabaminan and Nishnabe Kwe and Dao. So my name is Simone. Um, my name in 
my language Ojibwe is um, Big Storm Woman, and I'm from the Red Lake Nation here in northern Minnesota, Anishinaabe. And um, just want to offer, today has been such an intense day for me. I, I hope I don't cry while I'm trying to offer my little blessing here. <laughs> but um, I want to acknowledge that, you know, um, the beautiful uh, people who are going to be doing this panel um, and ask for blessings for them and their family. This work is sometimes hard and we carry a lot and we carry it with a lot of grace and beauty. Um, and I'm just so proud to be part of the group of many, many women who have joined our webinars, um, many relatives who have joined our webinars um, to stand up for Mother Earth, to stand up for our communities and to do um, the best that we can with what we've been given and to bring our gifts to the table as authentically, as humbly and as powerfully as we can. And to thank all of the people who make this uh, webinar possible. There's a lot that goes into it and a lot of people have given of their time, their energy, their expertise. And I ask that you watch over them, get your money due, uh, watch over their families, keep them safe and uh, keep us all focused and well-fed and joyous and um, blessings to you all. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Simone. Um, <clears throat> it's important that we're able to uh, engage in, in, in this discussion, not only for political reasons, but to like maintain our spiritual connection with each other as well. So thank you for that offering um, to open up this discussion. So excited about this discussion this evening um, to talk about free prior informed consent. It's a long term. What does it mean? And what does it mean for indigenous people and indigenous women specifically? And so I'm very excited for our panel this evening who are gonna um, help us um, get into what this does mean and why is it important for us? Um, and so very excited to have here with us um, Ashley McRae, who is um, with the Indigenous Environmental Network, and she works on our Green New Deal policy um, campaign work and is going to introduce herself more. We also have Myrna Cunningham King, who is a Makita uh, feminist and Indigenous act activist from Nicaragua, who is here with us this evening um, and will also like have more to share of her introduction. And, um, and we're also gonna be joined uh, by Fawn Sharp, um, who has been working with tribal nations across the country in different capacities, political and um, tribal. And so looking forward to hearing her insights as well um, about free prior informed consent. So um, I'm gonna um, offer an opportunity for each of them to um, introduce themselves. And then we're gonna get into some questions about um, both ethnic and, and indigenous feminisms. So, um, Ashley, I'd like you to um, have a few um, moments to introduce yourself um, and talk a little bit about your work, and including if that includes with the free prior informed consent. Yeah, thank you so much, Benishi, and thank you, Simone, for that beautiful blessing. And I'm really excited to be here today uh, with my fellow panelists, um, you know, all across Turtle Island, who can really, you know, give, you know, story to why free prior informed consent is so important. So I just want to say, halako ke, hoisiye no loko. My name is Ashley, and I am a member of the Absentee Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma. I'm also Oglala and Chichangu Lakota. And I call the uh, Muskogee Creek Reservation, which is also known as Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, my current home. And I've, you know, lifelong Oki. Um, I am, as Benishi said, the Green New Deal organizer with the Indigenous Environmental Network. And so a lot of my job is really centered around, you know, entering into those policy spaces, uh, really working with uh, the presidential administration. 
um, various uh, departments and agencies that dictate uh, different policies that impact our communities and our land. Um, and really, you know, trying to push Congress uh, to push forward different policies and legislation that do include uh, free prior informed consent. And so it may be, you know, uh, a surprise to people, but uh, one of the main um, campaigns that we are pushing forward uh, through my campaign, uh, the Green New Deal, the Green New Deal at Indigenous Environmental Network, is a, a campaign called Thrive for Indian Country. And so, one of the um, really uh, comprehensive definitions that we have um, of FPIC, free prior informed consent, is actually embedded in the Thrive Act. And so, that's something that will be released this week. We also were involved in commenting and um, providing edits and providing um, different uh, context for some of the Green New Deal bills that were passed last week, which was during Earth Week. And so we saw, for instance, Cori Bush's, um, AOC, and Senator Markey's. And so while those don't have, you know, a thorough definition of free prior informed consent, um, we did make sure that it was included in there. And so that's really um, how my work and the and the the different things that I'm doing with Indigenous Environmental Network at the intersection of policy and environment um, happens to include free prior informed consent. So I'm excited to talk more about that here today. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, and, and just a reminder, and um, we're gonna try to get into discussion a bit and we have a few questions and I hope to like get into a little bit more. Um, and so it's such an important issue. We want to like make sure we say everything quickly, um, but we have interpretation. So uh, just be conscious of how quickly we're sharing. Um, Mirna, I'd like to um, invite you to share with us a bit about you, your work, um, and um, and your work with uh, free prior informed consent. Thank you, and more later. <laughs> and thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Naxa al sutralam kulatara mai I I greet you in the language of my people, the Miskito Nation in Nicaragua. I'm, I, I'm working in different levels, I would say, from the community to the globe, to the whole world. So what, um, Annie, I would say my main focus is self-determination of indigenous peoples. And I have been involved in the last 40 years in the creation of, and the establishment of autonomous regions in Nicaragua, in my region. And it's, a, it's a, a, an autonomous system that combines regional multi-ethnic autonomy with autonomy of the indigenous communities and territories. And as part of this um, process of building a different type of, of multi-ethnic state in Nicaragua, one of the article of the autonomy law established the right of the equal right for men and women. So we have been promoting, we promoted a policy, a gender policy in our autonomous government and, and different legislation to ensure um, equal participation of men and women. At the regional level in Latin America, I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of the Fund for Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is an intergovernmental uh, organization created by the, by the 19 states of Latin America states and three non-European states. It's an Ibero-American um, composition. And the, the fund has the mandate to support a self-determination, self-determined development of indigenous peoples. And as part of the fund, we have created something that is called the Program of Indigenous Women of Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is a network of the different women organizations in the region and the, the offices, the Secretariat of 
uh, women in each one of the mixed organization. At the global level, I have been supporting the establishment of the Indigenous International Indigenous Women Forum. This is a global network of indigenous women. And I'm also part of I'm chairing the Pawanka Fund. This is a, an indigenous-led fund that supports initiative that uh, promote self-determination of indigenous peoples at the global level. And gender balance, gender relation is one of the cultural ind indicators that we um, try to uh, ensure that any type of support that goes through Pawanka Fund uh, supports a uh, gender um, relation. So this is part of my work. Thank you very much, Mirna. That was important. I, some of the government policy pieces are really interesting to hear, and I hope we can get into more of some of those. Um, next, we are to have Fawn Sharp. Um, and Fawn was um, absolutely gracious to um, to join this call in um, up against the same time that she was participating in a tribal council meeting. So she's been a bit delayed and we'll have her introduce herself when she comes, when she's uh, free. Um, but we know that's important work as well. Um, so hopefully she'll be joining us soon and we'll, we'll give her some time to introduce herself. So the first question that I have for you as a panelist right now and um, Ashley, I'm going to come back to you for this one, um, is what does indigenous feminism, indigenous feminisms, with the S, feminisms mean to you? Um, and do you consider yourself a feminist? Yeah, thank you for that question, Benishi. Um, so for me, uh, as a Lakota woman, as a Shawnee woman, what indigenous feminisms really means is, is our ability as indigenous women and indigenous femme identifying people to really reclaim our identity and our traditional roles um, in the society. And so, you know, really looking back, you know, before that colonial context to see how our indigenous women and femme ancestors, you know, lived, how they related to each other and how they related to the world. And so, I think my uh, my understanding of feminism has definitely changed changed and uh, and shifted throughout time. But I would definitely say, you know, in this context and the way that we're talking about it here today, you know, I would consider myself a feminist. And I would, you know, beyond that, consider myself a Lakota Wia um, or a Shawnee woman, um, because you know, I really think that each of our different beautiful indigenous communities have different roles and different um, traditions for our indigenous women and femmes. And so, you know, by reclaiming that identity, it's a way of reclaiming who we are, you know, as those women in our, in our culture and our society. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, so Mirna, you, you started to get into this a bit, a little bit, um, but uh, asking you the same question, um, what does indigenous feminisms mean to you, um, you, your community, your people, or, and then um, do you consider yourself a feminist? It's um, the, the term feminist has not been an indigenous term. So I, I would say that it, I'm, I'm more over 70. So I, I would say that in the last 20, 20 years, there have been a movement of indigenous women demanding, I would say, the, the right to use the term of feminism. And it has been uh, expressed in different ways, community feminism, indigenous feminism, so they, I think there is a whole effort of indigenous women to build this concept of, of feminism, the right of indigenous women to really uh, struggle and to really work towards gender relations in the communities. But I would say that from the beginning, the position of indigenous women is that you cannot struggle for equal rights between men and women if you do not have collective rights as peoples. 
So I would say that is one of the characteristic of indigenous feminism. We struggle for individual right as women, but these can only be exercised if we also have collective rights as indigenous peoples. And that combination of indigenous and collective rights is a characteristic of indigenous feminism. I, some, for some years, I did not want to be a feminist because I felt that, that, that the concept of feminism was, um, was, did not apply um, in a very respectful way to indigenous women. Uh, the, the ones that, the women that consider themselves feminist were, were racist and they discriminated indigenous women. So I did not want to be part of that movement, but I think we have tried during the last 25 years to build our own feminist, indigenous feminist space and to build our own concept, our own theory, our own practice of indigenous feminism. And I think that is a, a, a struggle that will continue in the next years. And I'm happy to see that you are discussing it openly. Sometimes that is not very easy in most of our communities. Thank you for that deeper context. I think, um, you know, for, for us right now, as Ayen and um, Simone, Simone and I hold the indigenous feminisms work within IEN and we say feminisms mm -hmm. because it means a lot of different things to different people and so we're intentional when we say feminisms um, and for me personally you know I, I think about the the influence of patriarchy that came with colonization right and so for me when I think about feminism yes that term is not was not needed, it doesn't exist in our languages, right? Um, a feminism doesn't exist in our languages. Um, but, you know, thinking about the context of colonization and the patriarchy that came with that, I think there's an, a purpose and need for feminism um, to return our traditional roles that tried to get wiped out by colonization. Um, so let's, let's, jump in a bit more about um, free prior informed consent. Um, I'm going to come to you, Mirna, first, but, um, you know, this has been circulating in the in the international circles for some time. Um, it's becoming more relevant in some um, countries right now in the US, it's becoming a little more uh, talked about and uh, amongst tribal nations. Um, so what does, you know, what what relevance does free prior informed consent have on your community and your work? The free prior and informed consent is the right that an indigenous nation, group, community has to determine their, their development, the right to exercise self-determination. Of course, if you do not have um, and a mechanism that ensure your right to self determination, you need to. Did we lose Mirna? Ashley, can you hear Mirna? No, okay. So we're gonna come back to Mirna in a bit. Um, and I'm gonna pass this on to um, Ashley for the time being, and then we'll see if we can get Mirna back and, and catch her because she was starting to get into some good stuff there. <laughs> um, so Ashley, uh, what, what relevance does free prior informed consent have to you, your community and your work? 
Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, definitely, you know, listening really intently to Mirna. She was right in the middle of that flow. So I hope she does hop back on. Um, but, you know, free prior informed consent is so crucial for our communities, uh, for the work that I'm doing personally, and really just, you know, for the future, um, if we are going to move forward into a regenerative economy that is, you know, feminist, and that does include Indigenous people and Black communities and our future generations. And so, you know, we know that uh, the Biden administration released an executive memo right when he got into office that was asking each of the federal agencies to determine what it looks like to have what he was calling, quote unquote, meaningful consultation with tribal nations. Um, really, we know that this is not enough. Uh, we know that we cannot leave federal agencies to decide what this means within their own agency without really any consistency or ability to really enforce a minimum standard for meaningful consultation. And so, you know, our communities, we've long witnessed what, it happen what happens uh, when the U.S. federal government consults with our nations. Um, these agencies and companies will call a meeting, they'll leave out a sign-in sheet, and they'll call it consultation. And far too often, they, they equate consultation as a substitute for consent. And so, like, like Mir and I was saying, you know, like Benishi, like what you were saying, free prior informed consent, it's, it's a basic underpinning of Indigenous people's inherent right of self-determination. And, and this is something that the international world has, you know, already taken a hold of. The United States just happens to be very far behind the, cur the curve. And so, you know, what this really means for our communities, me as an indigenous woman living in a very highly uh, oil, and oil and gas based economy with lots of different pipelines and fracking projects concentrated all around me, you know, this really looks like a reduction of missing murdered indigenous people. Because we know that this, you know, the, the, the thorough line for all of this really is consent. And so, you know, by codifying free prior informed consent, we can help ensure that a culture of consent with indigenous peoples and in our nation becomes normalized. And this looks like no more illegal pipelines, uh, the de decrease in missing murdered indigenous women, children and relatives. And also, you know, recognizing that because there, are, there is no consent with our tribal nations or importantly, our tribal communities when these pipelines are coming through, that does um, accelerate the occurrence of man camps. Um, and, and really, you know, this looks like the realization of indigenous and tribal sovereignty, self-determination and autonomy. And so, you know, free prior informed consent, it is, you know, something that we're trying to get our communities to understand, but it is such a crucial and important uh, term for uh, policy. And I'll check there. Thank you, Ashley. I, I think it's important to, to understand like what is happening with it even on a national con context. So thank you for sharing that. And hopefully we're gonna, we do have Mirna. Mirna yeah, is back with us. Um, Mirna, I'm gonna ask to um, pause to bring you back in because uh, Fawn has joined us now, and so I'd like to have um, Fawn welcome. Welcome. Uh, glad to see you here. I know um, it's been a busy day for you and um, probably still a busy evening, so much appreciation for you joining us today, this evening. Um, and I wanted to give you a few minutes to introduce yourself um, and your work. And um, and we, we went ahead and jumped into this first question that we ask on all of the webinars. And so maybe you can include that as part of your introduction is, what does um, indigenous feminisms mean to you? And do you consider yourself a feminist? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, oh, good evening. My name is Fawn Sharp. I serve as vice president here at the Quilot Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. And I just, uh, in, in between uh, tribal council meetings, we finish up a legal session and I have a public session that begins at 530. So this worked out perfectly, uh, this, this window. So I, I do thank you for uh, the invite and just a little bit about my background. So before I became an elected official, I served as uh, our nation's attorney general. And during my years of service as a lead attorney here at Quinault, I was uh, invited actually to this very room that I'm in which is a conference room at our uh, Quinault Division of Natural Resources. And uh, I was told we had some visiting Russians and they wanted to learn about our legal system. And, and so I was invited to come up and, and talk to them. And I said, you know, when do you need me? And they said, can you be here in five minutes? And so I left my office, I came up here and when I walked in this door, 
I was expecting to see Russians, tall Russian uh, people, and they were Russian indigenous, they were indigenous peoples from Northern Siberia. And so uh, halfway through my presentation through an interpreter, I found I instantly connected with them. My and apologies, Fawn. Can you come just a little bit slower? We have interpretation happening simultaneously. Okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll slow it down a bit here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And, and so uh, halfway through uh, our interpreter, uh, I found a connection. I, I instantly connected uh, with the elders that were here. And I then realized there are indigenous peoples all over the world. And I set out to study international human rights law. And that following year, in 2003, I studied uh, overseas and I uh, met with students from all over the world who were interested in the rights of indigenous peoples. And at that time, it was the international decade of indigenous peoples and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was being drafted. And I had no idea back then that I would someday become an elected official. I thought for sure, uh, you know, after a lifetime of studying and wanting to be an attorney, I figured I was going to be destined uh, to be an attorney the rest of my life. I had no idea or no interest uh, whatsoever in entering tribal politics. Uh, but the creator had a different plan for my life. And so I got elected in 2006. The following year is when the United Nations uh, at, at their General Assembly adopted UNDRIP. And I was really saddened that uh, the United States was not one of the, the signatories. And so that happened my first year as an elected official. And I made it my mission from my very first term in office all up until present day uh, to advance the rights of indigenous peoples in, in the areas of climate change, as well as civil and human rights. And this last weekend, Saturday, uh, the Washington State Legislature passed a climate bill that we have been working on for a decade and a half. Uh, I was uh, in incredibly uh, challenged my first year in office uh, in dealing with climate change that uh, we couldn't get any resolve at the state level and certainly at the United States Congress. We took an initiative uh, out to the citizens in 2018 in the fossil fuel industry uh, the Western States Petroleum Association spent $33 million to kill our campaign here in, in Washington state. Well, when this bill started uh, moving through the state legislature, we were able to incorporate every um, section that uh, went in word for word from this, the initiative language. And so what that means is uh, we were able to include consent around uh, sacred sites. We were uh, able to secure $50 million per biennium uh, over 10 years, so uh, $250 million to move our villages to higher ground. 10% of these uh, carbon revenues are for tribal governments. And of the body that makes the decision on how those funds are gonna be distributed, uh, we secured four seats, uh, along with the consent language, blue carbon uh, dollars for our tribal nations on the east side of the state that are vulnerable to wildfires. And so uh, with all of those things uh, in those provisions, we were able to secure uh, the necessary resources. And so that language of FPIC, when we uh, advanced the citizen initiative in 2018, it was our goal to effectively mainstream FPIC here in the state of Washington. The year after uh, our initiative, the attorney general in the state of Washington adopted effective immediately uh, implementing uh, free prior and informed consent. And then this last month, the insurance commissioner here in the state of Washington. So by agency by agency, as well as piece of legislation by piece of legislation here in the state of Washington, we're advancing it. And, and now with uh, President Biden issuing an executive order on consultation and wanting to elevate uh, that issue among all the different federal agencies, we are including it there. And so at NCAI, that's part of our, our domestic policy agenda on advancing free prior and informed consent, but we also have pressed the United States to advance FPIC uh, as a matter of foreign policy. And I used to uh, believe that we wanted to achieve political equality with the United States here and we need to elevate, but I, I've come to realize that we actually stand up here with the rest of the world. The United States is here and they need to elevate uh, because these are fundamental principles that transcend national borders. 
It, these are rights that are gifted to us by our almighty creator. And so we need to hold everyone accountable in the global community to uh, recognize, appreciate, enforce, and understand the, the inherent civil rights of indigenous peoples. And so I'm eager and excited to continue to advance the work that we've been able to do with regard to FPIC on climate policy. Washington State, as of Saturday, is the second state to price carbon and actually hold uh, those who are directly responsible for polluting accountable. And those resources are now going to relocate our villages to higher ground, help us restore our watersheds, uh, protect our fisheries, protect our forests. And so uh, we're going to continue this momentum, build and grow it uh, nationally and internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you um, uh, sort of jumped jumped right in where we had, um, we're getting into like the details of what free prior informed consent is. And so thank you for like sharing that context, both of nationally what you've seen, but also for your own community. Um, I want to come back to, to Mirna and we're going to go into a few other questions as well and hopefully have some discussion with each other and just um, to share with you also fun it, um, towards the end if you're if you're um, interested you know there will be time if you want to ask questions of others on the panel with you. Um, okay. and we lost Mirna earlier um, through a technology issue so I'm going to tried to have her invite us back because she started to get into some details about the UN context and other and her community as well. Thank you, Mirna. Did we, did, is she frozen again? Oh no. Mirna? I would say that in Latin America, there have been deflation. But we fix, I'm, uh, are you losing me again? No. We can hear you now. Bueno. Or maybe not. Very, okay. Very few countries have specific legislation on free prior and informed consent. In, in our case in Nicaragua, we have since 1987, the establishment of autonomous region. And our constitution established that any type of agreement over our natural resources should be approved by our, our, our autonomous government and it right to decide what type of investment will happen in their territory. So there is a, 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 a process set in place that begins at the community level. It moves to the territory that, or, um, that unite, unify several communities. Then it moves to the regional government. And when it moves to the regional government, there it is where the, it, it, the, the decision is taken before the central government can decide anything that is related with natural resources in our region. This, um, this process is, um, is in our legislation, in our law, and it, we try to apply it for everything that is related with natural resources. But as I said, in other countries, we do not have specific legislation. And generally, if, for example, in Colombia, in other countries, if they are now reviewing their practices of free prior and informed consent. So there, there are some protocols in some countries and in others, there are only community protocols. But I would say in general, free prior and informed consent is related with the recognition of self-determination in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But the countries that have ratified convention, ILO Convention 169 tries to reduce that right, to diminish that right, and only accept 
consultation and not free prior and informed consent. Thank you. Thank you, Mirna. I, um, I think where we're at is just starting to get to some understanding of what free prior informed consent um, is. And our next question is really about, um, you know, what are the opportunities and challenges? And, and you know, I think about like what has been happening um, in communities up until this point, you know, free prior informed consent. Sometimes people can think about the last part about consent being the only piece of it, but uh, free prior informed consent includes a lot more, you know, be free being without force or, or coercion, um, informed being given all of the information and, uh, and information in context that makes sense to communities. Um, and, you know, sometimes that means, you know, understanding all of the different pieces, including um, what are solutions and uh, real solutions and false solutions. And then um, prior being before any construction or project or anything has happened um, and, and prior to anybody putting a shovel in the, in the dirt, <laughs> that those things are all happening in addition to consent and consent being like mm -hmm. not consultation, not just saying, hey, we've talked to you about it, but that mm -hmm. people have given permission or not permission for any kind of project. Um, and so, um, you know, I want to ask this question about, you know, what do you see as the current um, opportunities and challenges for free prior informed consent? And I'm going to come um, to Ashley, um, uh, uh, Fawn, and then Mirna. Thank you. So ahead, oh, yeah. Thank you, Vinishi. And thank you, Fawn and Mirna for um, your your. Uh, context that you're providing. And so, you know, there really are a lot of opportunities to push forward free prior informed consent right here, right now. And so a lot of the work that I'm doing is really engaging at a federal policy level and um, having these conversations with uh, the Biden administration. And, you know, I'll be frank that the Biden administration is more receptive. Uh, the folks in Congress in the situation that we have right now are more receptive to hearing our voices and partnering with us um, in these policy making uh, situations. Um, but I will say, you know, that is also uh, the flip side of the situation is that, you know, we are dealing with a neoliberal agenda and a neoliberal administration. And so, I would say, you know, even more important is, you know, our advocacy and pushing uh, this administration so that they know that we do want free prior informed consent. And so, you know, I would say, you know, some of the challenges, you know, lie in the fact that Biden did, you know, deliver that executive mem memo on meaningful consultation. And so a lot of tribal members or tribal leaders will, you know, say this is enough, you know, we have you know, this, this mandate from the Biden administration to really decide what meaningful consultation means. But what we're saying is that, you know, we need to push beyond that because we can't really leave it to not just this administration, but also the agencies within the administration to de decide among themselves, like what this actually means. And so we want to make sure that we have free prior informed consent codified into federal law. And so that going forward, if Biden happens to lose the next election, or if we get someone like Trump, we can make sure that our inherent rights as indigenous people are protected. Now, I will say that, you know, something that IEN is doing that may be a little bit different from other organizations or other folks who are pushing forward free prior informed consent is also including the community. And so oftentimes we'll see that this government to government relationship only involves the tribal nation um, proper, which is, you know, the Indian Reorganization Act uh, created government um, and the federal government. But we want to include a space that ensures that our community, the people who are on the ground and who are most likely to be impacted and probably already are impacted, are able to be a participant in these decision making processes that impact their land, their communities, and their future generations. And so so I would say, you know, there's a whole lot of room open, especially like Fawn said in this climate arena. Last week we saw it, uh, IEN was 
busy and working overtime um, to make sure that we were commenting and editing uh, the different Green New Deal policies that came out. And many of them do include free prior informed consent. And I think now um, the onus is on us as indigenous communities to advocate and educate our tribal community and our tribal nation around what free prior informed consent means and how it is different and how it is you know, important and how it is different and distinguished from meaningful consultation. And so, you know, um, those are some of the opportunities that I see, but on the flip side, if we don't take this opportunity now and really push forward free prior informed consent, including a codified definition of who that applies to and what it actually means, uh, then we could really, you know, see this opportunity um, slipping from our grasp. And so I, I would say that's what my answer is. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, yeah, so I'm going to come um, to you, Fawn, and ask the same question of what do you see as some of the opportunities and challenges for implementation, both internationally and nationally, or even tribally, around free, prior, informed mm -hmm. consent? And, and just a reminder to everyone to speak slowly. You might see me do this hand gesture, which is slow down. <laughs> take, take a breath. So yes, fun. Yes, the, the, the greatest opportunity that I see for us is uh, to do what a lot of my mentors uh, advised me, e even when I served as the nation's attorney, I would hear them say this all the time. If you wanna be treated as a sovereign, you must act like a sovereign. And, and so, to me, in this context, that means we must recognize that as an attribute of our inherent sovereign existence and authorities, we possess the absolute right to have a say on anything that affects our land, our territories, our peoples. And if we, in our engagement at a local level, state level, regional level, national and international level, fully embrace, accept, and operationalize that principle in all that we do, beginning with our own tribal laws uh, that speak to the issue of free prior informed consent as it relates to any uh, relationship we have outside of our own nations. That to me is a foundational point. And as we engage at every level, we need to all articulate at a minimum when we sit down at a table with any other external entity, at a minimum, FPIC must be part of that deal because anything short of that, anything short of that where another sovereign can take unilateral action over our objections, and in some cases not even consulting us, that, that it, it does not meet the standard. In, for us to be able to enter into a government to government relationship, the other party must acknowledge and recognize that when we're at the table, that is a fundamental principle. And so as uh, tribal leaders are engaging with the Biden administration and there are discussions about meaningful consultation, there's a lot of uh, discussion around process uh, what does notice look like? What does following up look like? All of those other things that appear to be an improvement, and they are improvements over the last administration, but anything short of uh, achieving a policy objective where no other sovereign could take unilateral action without our free, prior, and informed consent, uh, it falls short. And, and so we have to accept that as a minimum uh, bargaining point uh, with any uh, external relationship we have. And so I think if we all um, implement our own vision uh, as, as a fundamental universal right in that regard and in that way in all engagement, that's how we're going to uh, make advancements because there are these other um, you know, thought processes for improving a consultation to make it meaningful, but it, it's not meaningful at all if another sovereign can take unilateral action. The other point I think that we need to really deal with the opportunity is uh, redefine our relationship uh, with the United States. Uh, because right now, if we have a conflict with the United States, our only, our only redress is litigation. And uh, 
there's an inherent conflict of interest. If the United States uh, chooses to sue on our behalf as our trustee for treaty conflicts and violation, there's an inherent conflict of interest where there's a Department of Justice attorney and a, an interior solicitor and the United States arguing against itself. And, and that's a point that tribal nations uh, found in the American Indian Policy Review Commission when I served on uh, the Sec Secretary Salazar's Trust Commission. So those are other attributes of uh, a redefined relationship with the United States that, that recognizes political equality, that recognizes uh, under international rules of diplomacy, if there are conflicts, uh, we, we need to have a dispute resolution process based on international rules of diplomacy, including official talks, negotiation, et cetera. But under all circumstances, we maintain a level of political equality. Uh, and anything short of that just it, it, it simply is not a government to government relationship. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that context of, you know, what this means for tribal nations here in the, in the U.S. context. And I want to uh, circle back around to Mirna um, to share a bit more, um, mm -hmm. of, you know, again, what do you see as the sort of opportunities and challenges um, for our community, for your community um, in regards to implementation of free prior informed consent? Um, so Mirna. Thank you. I, I, I see a lot of challenges, especially for, for indigenous peoples that are the majority in Asia, in Africa. There are so many countries that do not recognize that they exist. So I would say the first challenge is that the majority of countries still deny the existence of indigenous peoples. So of course they cannot exercise this right. In the case of Latin America, the majority of governments have recognized indigenous peoples. But what we have seen in the last decade is the strengthening of the model and extractivist model of development. And because of this model of development, there is no respect to the uh, laws that are recognized, that recognize the rights of indigenous peoples. And what we have seen in some countries like Colombia, for example, we have indigenous peoples that are being killed every day, every day because they are protecting their territory. They are demanding their right to exist. So we do have a criminalization and killing of indigenous peoples in the name of this model of development. This, and we, we see other countries like Brazil, where the government in itself has decided that they are not going to respect indigenous people's territories. So we, and on their other hand, we see countries where autonomy of indigenous people, self-government processes are advancing. So we do see the two, the two sides of free prior and informed consent. Countries that are denying indigenous people's rights, they are making it much more difficult to apply this right. Countries in which there is the recognition of autonomy, of self-government of indigenous peoples, it is much easier to apply the principle or and the right of free prior and informed consent. But in general, the main challenge is, the, is this, this model of development. Now, I do see opportunities. You are mentioning some opportunities in the US at this moment. I do agree that you should make use of that opportunity and you should try to ensure that any piece of legislation move farther than meaningful consultation because consultation is not free prior and informed consent, it's consultation. So we, that is very important. And as it has been said, 
in your relation with the nation state, of course, indigenous peoples have to make, take their position. I see an important opportunity. Uh, the world is trying to recover after COVID. Of course, we are still in COVID, but they're still talking about recover after cover, COVID. And the, the world is also facing different crises related with climate, related with food, with hunger, and they need our territories. They need our resources. If you are going to recover based on forestry, who are the owners of the forest? Where's the forest? Where's the biodiversity? So this gives indigenous peoples an opportunity to really pressure for free prior and informed consent. That means pressure for self-determination. But this, we cannot do it country by country alone. We need to articulate in a stronger global movement to really get this, make use of this opportunity. Because we, the, the, the world is facing the crisis, they need our resources, they need our territories, and we, if we articulate and we are strong enough, we may be able to make, take good use of this opportunity. Thank you, Mirna. The, uh, yeah, I think you've um, shared a number of, both the challenges I think are important, but I think the opportunities that you share are, are really where we're at, which, um, you know, I, I, we're gonna shift to, you know, having more of a, a little bit of a conversation and I have another question for y'all. Um, <clears throat> but just to, if y'all also have questions of each other, we're gonna come to that here in a minute. And so, you know, your your point, um, Mirna, is is asking me to think about um, a follow-up question being, if we, we, we've shared like what, what free prior informed consent means to our individual communities and even um, in the nations that we are right now. Um, but this call, this webinar, um, we broadcast this internationally and primarily through the Western hemisphere, but internationally, right? So, you know, when we're talking about indigenous peoples all the way from South America up through Alaska um, and the way that our, the, the nation states deal with them is different with indigenous peoples in Guatemala versus, you know, in in Alaska or or how they deal with indigenous peoples in Hawaii versus how they deal with uh, indigenous peoples in Sao Paulo or in, in Brazil, right? And so I want to ask us the everyone in the panel, like, what do you think is would be needed for for us to be able to use FPIC, but in a in a context that was around lar a larger community, a larger indigenous community. Um, and what do you think is needed to have that happen, uh, particularly in, you know, making decisions that impact not just our own nations or tribal nations or indigenous peoples, but also indigenous peoples of this hemisphere? Anyone want to jump at that? I'm not going to call on anyone to do that first, but just an uh, open question. Maybe I, can, I can go ahead. I think what we need is to use the language that is already defined in international standards of indigenous people's rights, like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as the language to negotiate whatever we are doing, negotiating in each one of the countries. That's why I said, okay, meaningful consultation is important, but we already gain in an international standard of free prior and informed consent. So we should aim to maintain those standards that are already set in place in these in international instruments. 
I think that is the type of articulation that we need at the international level. That in each one of our countries, we can really try to be strong enough to maintain those standards and to demand governments to respect those standards that they already approve in international instruments. Thank you. Thank you, Mirna. Ashley or Fawn, do you want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, I definitely just want to echo what Mirna was saying that we definitely need to make sure that we are, you know, all talking about the same thing. And so I think, you know, from an organizer perspective and, and, and the work we're doing here at Indigenous Environmental Network, um, that will involve really, you know, doing the work of translating this uh, free prior informed consent in a way that resonates with our communities who are on the ground and really doing that work to stand up for our tribal sovereignty and to protect Unchimaka, our grandma Mother Earth. And so I think, you know, codifying this language, codifying, you know, a specific definition that works for us, you know, at this organizational level, so that we can then do the work of translating that definition in a consistent way uh, that's really concise and makes a lot of sense to our communities on the ground so that they can then, you know, begin to organize around it. And so I think, you know, once we have that consistency of language and everybody's on the same page about what we're talking about and how it really does uphold and, you know, ensure our tribal sovereignty and our inherent rights, I think then, you know, we can really do the work of pushing, you know, pushing on Congress and pushing on all these, you know, powerful colonial institutions uh, to, you know, then codify a free prior informed consent in their codes. And so, you know, I think there, that's really where the struggle is going to be um, because this does involve, you know, free prior informed consent, it does involve these very powerful colonial institutions letting go and giving up that power. Um, but that's, you know, totally okay because these are things that always belong to us as indigenous communities and indigenous nations. And so, you know, I think, you know, empowering us, uh, like, like Fawn already said, you know, to, to be sovereign um, because we are sovereign and these are inherent rights that came way before colonization. And then, you know, making sure that we have the context and the consistency so that everybody can really push forward in their own tribal nations. And, you know, even at a higher level, at the state level and the federal level um, to push forward and demand uh, that we codify free prior and consent. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Fawn, I want to see if you I give you an opportunity if you want to answer that question of like what you know what would it take for us to like look at free prior informed consent in a sort of unified indigenous um, context, a larger indigenous sort of context. Yes. Uh, I I really appreciate that question as well. Uh, when you consider our, our national uh, organizations, this last week I've had a, a direct uh, conversation and call with uh, AFN's president. And between our two uh, national organizations, we represent over 1,100 sovereign tribal nations, First Nations in North America. And so, um, to me, when we start uh, working regionally and, and then we start working uh, globally at various venues, uh, adopting a basic set of operational principles and, and rules of engagement, uh, not only uh, within our own nation, intertribally, and then certainly uh, externally, I think those are opportunities that we have. And when we're able to build these policies and have the leverage that we've created in in terms of a climate conversation, in terms of the disproportionate impacts of COVID. Uh, I've made it very clear uh, in, in my engagement here in this country that uh, it is true that we are vulnerable to a global pandemic and COVID because our trustee has failed to, to live up to their trust responsibility as evidenced in uh, multiple reports from the US Commission on Civil Rights to Congress. But it doesn't end there. Um, we've tried to raise revenues through our own system of taxation and exercising governmental powers like any other sovereign nation should. And uh, that's been uh, challenged at every level, local level with counties taxing uh, water parks, et cetera, uh, states taxing federally chartered cities, uh, the Tulalip tribes north of Seattle. And 
And then we're forced to try to generate profits with commercial entities. At every level, we are being uh, uh, socially, politically, and economically oppressed and challenged. And so uh, in the wake of COVID, in the wake of climate change, uh, the, the entire world sees that we are disproportionately impacted and we are marginalized and we are oppressed. And so, yes, in those conversations, we need to underscore and emphasize how very important it is. It's critically important. It's life and death uh, for all of us to not be able to um, to not be able to be recognized and engage with any other foreign uh, sovereign in a way that uh, fundamentally acknowledges our inherent uh, sovereign powers and authorities. And as we work through various issues like this and, and recognize that we have political leverage, that we have um, the attention of the world and, and then build on that momentum to come out of these uh, apocalyptic challenges of climate change and a global pandemic stronger, more resilient, it's all part of that same narrative and story that we get to write. And, and so I think those are the opportunities that I see for us to, uh, to come together to, to uh, implement a, a gold standard, if you will, for what it means to uh, implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from our perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you lay out a, a good sort of idea or plan for, you know, a, a strategy for sort of North America um, strategy on free prior informed consent. And I think Mirna was sharing a little more of, you know, what's happening in the global South and also internationally. Um, and then just to clarify uh, for those in the audience, um, AFN is the Assembly of First Nations in Canada. Although there is an AFN in Alaska, which is, <laughs> uh, but I think you were talking about the uh, the Canada uh, Assembly of First Nations, um, yes. and so just to remind us to to, to share out acronyms when we can. Um, so I want to uh, both sort of like engage a couple more questions, but um, also um, if y'all have uh, questions that you're ready to ask, you can nudge me. But I have a um, question for you, I, um, Fawn. I just want to see if you would share a little bit, um, you know, thinking of what you were sharing earlier about a sort of North America strategy. Like, what do you think right now is the level of support for um, the tribes in the U.S. Um, to support FPIC or even for Congress um, to support um, free prior informed consent as a federal policy practice? I think that the prognosis for making meaningful advancements with this administration is, is good. Uh, and, and I have a couple of reasons why I, I, I uh, make that assessment. For one, we have uh, pressed upon this administration even before the, the election of President Biden uh, during the, the election process and in, in establishing platforms that we called on the United States to uh, appoint a special envoy or an ambassador to the United Nations on the rights of indigenous peoples. We uh, convened a direct consultation with the US State Department on that question. We also know that the White House Council on Native American Affairs has uh, been reinstituted and it's now chaired by the new Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, uh, a, a Native woman uh, who is uh, every bit of uh, us knows, understands these inherent rights that uh, we've long possessed for millennia. And in that context within the White House Council on Native American Affairs, uh, they are establishing various subcommittees and, and one of the subcommittees that they've advised us that they are uh, assembling is a subcommittee on international relations. And, and so there are these uh, various platforms and opportunities to advance uh, free prior and informed consent, both domestically as various uh, uh, agencies are, uh, are following the instructions of President Biden and the executive order but they're also laying a foundation for us to engage uh, internationally and for the United States to enlist subject matter expertise, uh, both at the, white, at the highest level, uh, at a cabinet level, at the White House Council, as well as uh, with the United Nations and the possibility for installing a special envoy or uh, um, an ambassador on the rights of indigenous peoples. And so those, in my mind, are 
good signals that we have an opportunity to make some advancements. And I am, I am cautiously optimistic and I am committed to ensuring that the work that we do both domestically and um, uh, multilaterally, whether it's North American indigenous peoples or globally, that we are positioned well to answer the call. Um, the United States is certainly highly motivated to uh, restore its standing globally on the rights, or on, on basic human and civil rights, and to pick up the Obama administration's uh, ideal to lead the world in implementation on UNDRIP. So I think we have a great deal of opportunity. We have uh, support at the White House, we have support in the Senate, and we have support in the House. And so we are going to do all we can to maximize the opportunity that's right in front of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vaughn. Um, so, you know, I, I at the top of the um, call, I offered the opportunity that we, um, you know, that also want to make sure that you all are meeting each other for the first time, um, and maybe you have questions of each other. So I want to open that space up a little bit before we wrap up and close. I have one more closing question for y'all, but yeah. Either Ashley or Myrna, Bond, or you have questions of each other maybe? I don't think yeah. I have a, a question. I, I have a comment. Uh, I am just incredibly grateful. Any opportunity that we can share a space, uh, share thinking thoughts. I take a real time pulse of where uh, we stand in, in many uh, areas, uh, whether it's geographical areas or subject matter areas. And I'm just so deeply honored and, and happy to be here. And thank you for the invite. Um, I do have a council meeting that I have to get back to uh, here shortly, but I didn't want this moment to pass without saying Siokuel, thank you. And I look forward to uh, continued dialogue. I appreciate, uh, appreciate everyone at IEN. Thank you. Thank you. Mirna or Ashley? I, I, I would also like to, to thank, and of course we can have a long conversation with Fawn. I would like to know exactly how, how your, your council function and what kind of international exchange can happen between um, autonomous governments in our region. But of course we do not have time. But and with Ashley, I am very interested in the, the codification. What, how have you advanced in that process of codification of the free prior and informed consent? Yeah, um, so I'll go ahead and um, really quickly just say, you know, I'm really grateful to also be in this space. I'm really excited to be here with uh, Mirna and uh, President Sharp. You know, I really think that, you know, with our different voices, you know, being in the climate space and then being in the policy space and the tribal government space, that if we come together on this issue that I really feel like we'll be able to make some even more impactful waves than we've already made um, on our own. And uh, to your question, Mirna, you know, I think that there, there really are, you know, serious opportunities around codifying uh, the language for free prior informed consent. Um, we've been working really hard in the policy arena, uh, just trying to get our voice at the table and, you know, really explaining, you know, through multiple meetings, um, you know, what free prior informed consent is and why these things are so important to our communities. And so what we see right now is that, you know, many of these uh, bills that are coming ar out around the Green New Deal, uh, they do have, you know, a language or a nod uh, to free prior informed consent. But where we're at in the process is that it's not actually, you know, well defined. And so, you know, I think our best definition that we have that we've been able to ensure is actually going to stay in an actual policy piece that's being pushed forward um, is in the Thrive Act. And so, you know, I think we're the work to 
to be done is now is really to push beyond this initial set of policy um, because you know many of these politicians who are codifying free prior informed consent in their policy are known as like left wing or left flank um, or radical uh, politicians and so we really want to normalize uh, free prior informed consent and so we can get those you know more moderate uh, politicians to begin including it in their legislative pieces and so you know I really think that there are many different Different pieces of the pie and there's plenty of room at the table for everybody and in fact you know I think our our national uh, movement will be made more powerful if we have those international voices reminding us that you know we already have language around this that there have already been fights and then also at the same time being able to see some of the struggles and um, and you know the 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 issues that do come with free prior informed consent and so you know I think um, there are many opportunities available, and uh, I know that at IEN that we're just now um, beginning the work of ensuring that we, you know, do have some sort of working group moving forward. And so, you know, I guess my question is, you know, can we invite you, Mirna, and you, uh, President Sharp, to start joining these working groups so that we can, you know, add all of our um, collective voices together and ensure that our indigenous, you know, rights, our inherent rights um, are, are upheld in this nation. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Those are some big uh, questions. And, you know, I definitely invite um, you, Ashley and Myrna and Yvonne to exchange your emails with yeah. each other because I feel like there are some deeper questions that we may have uh, run out of time for. Um, but I wanted to ask this question in closing and you guys can each give a closing statement. I may come to you first, Vaughn, because I know you're going on to another engagement after this. Um, and so the question is, this webinar series um, within IEN is around indigenous feminisms and a lot of complexities of what does that mean in terms of food and health and, um, and safety and an environment and, and lots of different things. We've had many discussions about lots of stuff from the context. And so I wanted to um, see if you would share just your thinking, whether it's personal or from your work position, um, you know, what do you feel like is the the, the opportunity or connection, you know, the, the name of this webinar was free prior informed consent protection of land and body. Um, and body being very specific about women, women's body. Um, and so I just wanted to see if you had anything that you would like to share um, about that um, in closing. Um, so I'll go to you, Fawn, and then Mirna, and then Ashley. Yes, uh, thank you. And I'm happy to have been here to cut the very last uh, question and participate fully here. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yes, from my perspective, uh, when we talk about uh, basic human and civil rights, uh, th those are rights that are gifted to all of us individually and collectively. And so whether we're talking about the collective rights of indigenous peoples and, and the ability to say yes or no uh, to consent, uh, when you look at that at a micro level, uh, the, the individual, we, we all possess uh, an, an individual sovereignty, a micro sovereignty. We all possess uh, an individual uh, interest in, in our, our humanity, uh, both civil and human rights. And, and so I see all of these rights as very consistent with our teachings are uh, for, for millennia, no matter where you go inside of uh, Indian country or uh, indigenous people's communities, those are, are, are foundational to, to who we are in our relationship. There's often this thought that upon European contact, uh, we were uncivilized in this country. Uh, but when you look at social scientists uh, and they have this, uh, triangle and, and pyramid of maturity, whether it's an individual maturity or societal maturity, at the very base are selfish people. And then they become independent. And then at the, t at the top, uh, interdependent. And I often make the point that as indigenous peoples, we're not only interdependent relative to fellow humanity, we are interdependent relative to all things living, relative to our creator. Th that those are just foundational fundamental values and principles of indigenous peoples that, that make us so distinct. And so when, when I think about both the individual as well as the collective uh, rights to free prior and informed consent, 
uh, that is, is very much a part of who we are. And it's not something new. Uh, the, these are values that we've all held for millennia. Thank you. Thank you, Fawn. Uh, Mirna? free prior informed consent and protection of land and body. What does this mean for also women and protection of body? Or is there a relationship? Um, yeah. yeah. As, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, 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 the basis of, the, of women organizations Indigenous Women Organization is to ensure presence as women, but as members of our community. So the, the complementarity between individual and collective right is part of the, I would say the DNA of Indigenous Women Organization. So when we say protect body, and protect land, it, we mean that this body cannot survive if it's not part of the relationship that we have between persons, between uh, other, the spirits, between the trees, the plants. We are part of that relationship that we build between human beings and nature and the spiritual world. So um, I, I do not think only on one part of the body. When we say protection of body and land, we're thinking of the, of the, of the different aspect of this person, not only on reproductive rights to, say, to, to mention something. We're talking about the, the, the right to exercise your, to use your language, to practice your spirituality, your, your right to be member of that community, of that family, to use your language. So I think that's, that's an important lesson that indigenous women have been teaching in the last decades. When indigenous women found that it was necessary to self-organize and not only be part of the other mixed organization, that was the reason why they did it, because they wanted to change the power dynamic in families and communities, respecting th that complementarity between individual and collective rights. So I think that is something that we that we have learned and we are trying to teach it. And I would say that's the main reason why we do not connect with, some, I would say, some part of the feminist discourse, because we need to ensure this relationship. And I think that is what we are trying to teach. And when we talk about free prior and informed consent, and it means that for a community to exercise that right, they, the community has to define affirmative actions to ensure the voices of women, to ensure the voices of the, of the youth, to ensure the voices of the elders. It, it has to change. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of, um, I would say, of lessons that we have learned, for example, in the practice of, uh, of customary law related with violence against women in our communities. And what we have done is that we challenge those practices that did not respect women. We have been able to change those cultural practices that were oppressive against women. So I think this is a work that we have started as indigenous women, but we need to continue. And we, do, we should not accept that other groups uses our, our slogan of protecting land means protecting bodies with, with, and taking out the whole intangible um, aspect 
of relationship that is the basis of indigenous people's culture. Thank you, thank you. It was great. <laughs> you know, just to think about like what, you know, the complexities of what opportunities this has for us to think about um, consent um, and consent to land and body. Um, so I'm gonna bring it to Ashley to share and then we're gonna close. Yeah, you know, so I definitely think President Sharp and Myrna did an excellent job of driving the point home. Um, but the only thing that I will, you know, reaffirm is that, yes, a violence against, you know, the earth, Unchimaka, our grandmother earth, you know, is violence against our people, especially our women and femmes. And so, you know, it's really important for us to understand how that violence against our lands is connected to the violence against our people, especially women, femmes, and children. And, you know, free prior informed consent, it's a crucial step toward dismantling all of the harmful settler colonial systems that oppress us. Um, it's really important that we move away from any practice that perpetuates colonial violences and it renders our people silent, invisible, and erased. And it's, it's really important that we move toward a system in which our people are full partners in all decision-making that impacts us and our lands. And so free prior informed consent, it protects our lands and it protects our people. It's also the pathway toward restoring indigenous autonomy, righting colonial wrongs, and ensuring that we have healthy land, air, and water for many future generations to come. And so for one, you know, one really quick concrete example is that, you know, if we have a system of free prior informed consent, then we can ensure that pipelines like DAPL, like Dakota Access Pipeline, do not exist. And that and we can ensure that those pipelines don't bring about the man camps that bring about the violence that really harms our women and our children. And so, you know. I guess one example, one further thing that I would like to add is that we do have to make sure that any codified definition we have here in the United States includes not just our tribal nations, but also our communities, because it can't be a situation in which our tribal nation may be a perpetuation of these colonial systems that only harm our communities for their benefit. We have to make sure that all of our people are considered. And so that's the one thing that I would leave us with. And to also you know, really drive home that point that by advancing free prior informed consent or FPIC, we can really normalize consent. And that means in all ways. So I just wanna say ni always. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for, you know, just bringing it back to the body and what does that mean in protection of our women. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I just want to thank, you know, all of our panelists mm -hmm. today. Um, free prior informed consent is, is complex and, and, and at its core, mm -hmm. it's also very simple, you know, free being, you know, we're not going to be forced, right? prior being, you know, we need to have meaningful um, discussion and, and planning before things ever like get constructed, um, informed that we have all of the information and we have um, that we can engage in sharing that information um, in languages that, you know, are relevant to us in, in access to that information and all of it and not just select information and then consent being, you know, about um, not just giving permission, but in times not giving permission and, and, and saying, no, we don't want that. We've been given all the information and no, we don't want that. And, and there are times right now um, that we are in and, and we've had a long history of not being able to say no and to consent and, and indigenous communities all across the world are standing up to say, no, this is what we want because we want something better for our future generations, our seven generations, our grandchildren, our children, and we want something better for now as well. So I want to thank, um, thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Mirna. Thank you, Fawn, who already, I had to jump off. Um, and so I want to thank you all. And Tune in again, y'all, and you know, share this. The, the webinar will be posted up later if you want to share it with other folks. Um, but tune in again um, next month. We have exciting offerings coming up, um, looking at indigenous women of the Pacific. Um, so look forward to that, y'all. We'll be, that'll be coming through in, in May. So um, thank you again. Thank you to our interpretation team. 
thank you to our tech team um, and, and their support that they offer us as well. And thank you all uh, those who attended and listened in and shared, you know, comments and questions in the chat. So good night. Mm -hmm.